The Whistler. <laughs> Presented by the United States Air Forces in Europe. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, the Whistler's strange story. The doll's name was Susie. Laura Haven, 28 and attractive, and secretary treasurer of the small but successful QB stationery company was worried, and with reason. For unless she found the means to replace $4,000 of company funds she'd used in an unfortunate market venture before the stockholders' annual audit, scheduled within two weeks, she faced certain dismissal and prosecution for embezzlement. But Laura was still hopeful. Yes, you're certain you'll find a way to replace the money. Just that you've found ways to replace smaller amounts in the past. And at the moment, sympathetic Clay Hillman, plant manager and vice president, the man who gave you your start with the company six years ago, seems most likely to accept your carefully rehearsed sob story. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's the way it is, Mr. Hillman. I hated to come to you, but... I wish I could help you save your father's business, Laura. You've made a fine record here, but I just can't. Four thousand dollars is just beyond me. I I could probably get by on twenty five hundred if I had to. I could sell my stock in this company, sell my TV set. That's still way too much for me personally, Laura. Just isn't possible. I'm terribly sorry. Forget it, Mr. Hillman. I'll solve it some way. I'm sorry about your dad's tough luck, Laura, but four thousand dollars is a lot of money. Uh, I can't think of a thing that might help. I was wondering about Lester Cranston. My boss? Surely you don't expect me to ask him. Oh, of course not. I- I'd get his wife Ruth to ask him if she thought there was any chance of his letting me have it. He probably would. He gives her everything she asks for, and she asks for everything. I don't think that's fair, Monica. That's because you don't know Ruth Cranston half as well as you think you do. I think I know her pretty well. She's my closest friend. You talk as though you were in love with Lester. Uh uh-uh, uh, not me. Married men are out with me. Besides, Lester's a straight shooter. And that's more than I can say for Ruth. What do you mean by that, Monica? I mean she's no good. She goes out with other men. I don't believe you. I've seen her with one more than once. You, uh, know who he is? Yes. You haven't told Lester? I'm not telling anybody. Yes. I'll get it. Hello? Laura? Oh, yes, Ruth. I was just about to call you. Uh, Excuse me a second. Ruth Cranston's on the phone now. Then I think I'll drop in at the neighborhood movie on the corner. You two will be prattling for an hour. See you in the morning. Good night. Good night, Monica. Um, go ahead, Ruth. Laura, can you meet me someplace right away? I've got to talk to you. I'm alone. Can't you talk over the telephone? No, I can't. It's too important. Oh, please meet me, Laura. It's only a little after eight. Please, Laura. I need your help. All right. How about the blue Oreo? We can talk in a booth. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Now relax, lady, and tell me what's bothering you. Well, first of all, everything's all over with Lester and me. I've left him. He lost his mind completely over your cute little apartment mate, Monica Alston. That's crazy, Ruth. I live with Monica. I know her. Nobody knows her. She's only been in town a year or so. And Lester's not only fallen for her, he's let her get him involved in a diamond smuggling racket. Oh, Ruth, you're imagining things. I even found out how they worked the whole thing. Lester's firm imports a shipment of dolls from London every three or four weeks. So? And each shipment contains one special doll with two or three diamonds hidden in the doll's head. Now, wait a minute, Ruth. Slow down. It's true. Now, the sender in England always sends a telephone number and a password or or a catchphrase along with the doll. Well, then Lester or Monica makes the phone call. A messenger picks up the doll later on. And then the next day, another messenger brings the money. Oh, well, Lester and Monica keep half of it, 
and send the rest to the post office box in London. A different one each time. For certain of this? Yes, I have absolute proof. This afternoon, I found one of the dolls in Lester's clothes closet. Yes. There were two large diamonds taped to the inside of the doll's head with heavy adhesive tape. You're positive they were real diamonds? Of course I am, Laura. And, Laura, I'm scared to death. You? Why? Because Lester came home unexpectedly today, and I didn't have time to put the doll back in his closet. And, Laura, when he saw me with it, why, he acted just like a crazy man. He said if I ever told anyone what I knew, he'd kill me. You've just got to do something for me, Laura. I'm desperate. I'm afraid to go back home. Well, what do you want me to do, Ruth? Well, I, I want you to go to the house and get my overnight cake. It's in the closet in my bedroom. Why didn't you bring it with you? Well, I intended to, of course, but I was so frightened, I forgot it. I got dressed and I practically ran out of the house. Oh, I just got to have it, Laura. My rings and my billfold and everything. Oh, yes, but suppose Lester's there. Well, he won't be. He's, he's having dinner with Mr. Wilson. You know he's business partner. But even if he comes back, it's all right. He knows you have a key to the house and that you're likely to drop in any time. You can just act surprised that I'm not there. And then find some excuse to go to my room. Oh, please, Laura. Well, I'll, please. I'll try, Ruth. Thank you, Laura. I knew you'd help me. I've got a bungalow at the Cliff Road Motel. And I'm registered under the name of Francis Thompson. I'll call you in the morning. When you reach Ruth's home, you find the house in darkness. As Ruth expected, Lester is out, the house empty. Within five minutes, you're back in your car. Ruth's overnight case safely beside you. Back in your apartment, you put it under your bed, decide to wait up for Monica. Confront her with what you've learned from Ruth. But when midnight arrives, and then one o'clock, and Monica is still out, your curiosity overcomes you, and you decide to open Ruth's case. Neither her jewelry or billfold are among the things she's packed. But you do find a doll. You quickly lift the loosely attached wig, remove the two strips of adhesive tape, and find under each a magnificent diamond. Then, as you hear the sound of Monica's key in the front door, you flick off your own lights and close your door. You're certain of only one thing, aren't you, Laura? Yes. You don't know just how, but those two diamonds are going to provide your $4,000, aren't they? Next morning, as you're preparing coffee, Monica bursts into the kitchenette with the morning paper. Laura. Oh, Laura, something terrible happened last night. Well, I'm not surprised. I wondered what kept you out so late. Nothing happened to me. It was Ruth Cranston. She was killed last night. Ruth? Killed? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, Monica. It's right here in the paper. She was found in a bungalow at the Cliff Road Motel, registered under a phony name. Someone shot her during the night. Monica's shocking announcement, tragic though it is, provides an unexpected opportunity for you, doesn't it, Laura? And you decide to say nothing to anyone about anything for the present. As soon as Monica leaves for her work, you phone Mr. Hillman at your own place of employment and obtain a week's leave from the office. Then you hurry to your room, re-examine the doll in Ruth's overnight case. A slip of paper tucked in the pocket of the doll's dress catches your attention. Phone Lake 3201... At 11.45 a.m. May 21st, ask for Mr. Earl White. Inform him the doll's name is Susie. It's exactly as Ruth said, isn't it, Laura? For nearly two hours, you weigh one idea against another. Then you reach a decision. You decide you'd be a sentimental fool not to take full advantage of this unexpected and accidental windfall. And at 20 minutes before noon, you walk two blocks to the drugstore and dial the late number. Yes? I'd like to speak to Mr. White. This is Mr. White. Uh, Mr. White, I've been asked to tell you that the, the doll's name is Susie. Thank you very much. You have the doll in your possession? Yes. Could you deliver it immediately, say, in an hour? Yes. Then wrap it in a box addressed to Earl White. Leave it with the parking lot attendant at the corner of Fenton and Clarkson Streets. Tell him I'll pick it up a little later. 
There's only one attendant? Just one. If the delivery is proper and the doll undamaged, you may expect a messenger at six this evening with full payment. Uh, Mr. White? Yes? I prefer you handle things a little differently this time. Oh? Address the envelope to Miss Wilma Jackson. Wilma Jackson? Have the messenger drop the envelope into the mailbox of apartment 4B. 4B? At 8874 Paxton Place. 8874 Paxton Place. Very well, unless unforeseen circumstances develop, delivery will be made as requested. When you return home, you decide on one additional precaution, don't you, Laura? Instead of making delivery in person, you'll drive to within a block of the parking lot. Hire the corner newsboy to carry the package to the parking lot. You wrap the box carefully, place it in Ruth's case for added safety, and then carry it to your car. As you open the door of your car... Hello, Laura. Uh, oh, Lester. Yes, I stopped by your office. They told me you were here. Why, well, I'm glad you came by. I just can't tell you how sorry I am about Ruth. I, I still can't believe it. You didn't see Ruth last night, did you, Laura? Why, 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 no... I talked to her about eight last night, but I didn't see her. Then what are you doing with her overnight case? Ruth asked me to pick it up, that's all. You know she'd gone to the Cliff Road Motel? Well, yes, she told Let's me. Let's go up to your apartment, Laura. Take a look inside that case. You've got some explaining to do. A doll and diamonds, huh? Diamonds? Oh, as if you didn't know. You're quite convincing, Laura. But I don't believe you. Honestly, I, I, I didn't know what was in Ruth's case until you opened it just now. Then you won't mind taking Ruth's case to the police, telling them everything that might help them? Of course not. Why should I? I, I? I was on the way to the police when you got here. Fine. I'll go with you. You? Yes, just as soon as I talk with my partner. I didn't want to go to the office today, so I phoned him and asked him to meet me here. That's probably Arthur now. Come on in, Arthur. You know Miss Haven, Arthur? Of course. Hello, Mr. Wilson. Lester, the police are looking for you. Oh? Well, I figured they'd want to question me. That's why I asked you to meet me here. I wanted to talk to you first. Now, you don't understand, Lester. The police don't want to question you. They're out to arrest you. They think you killed Ruth. They, they think I killed Ruth? Why? It seems she called them last night, told them you'd threatened to kill her. I, I, I don't believe it. It was somebody posing as Ruth. I don't think so, Lester. You see, I did see Ruth last night. She told me the same thing, that I'd threatened her life? Oh, why? Because she'd found out about your diamond smuggling with Monica. Monica? Yes, I see. Ruth told me everything. There wasn't anything to tell. Arthur and I have known for a week that our company was being used as a diamond smuggling cover-up. But neither of us knew which of our employees was involved. Yesterday afternoon, I... I accidentally discovered that Ruth was involved. Ruth? Yes, I'm sorry, but it's true. I got home a little early. When I opened the front door, Ruth was in the living room. She had one of our toy dolls in her hand, and she was quite flustered. The doll's wig was on the table, and Ruth had the diamonds in her hand. She had no explanation? None. She grabbed the doll, flew into a rage, and said she was leaving me and rushed upstairs. Ruth told me a different version last night, Lester. A reverse version. She said she'd discovered the doll, but you'd hidden it. She also told me you threatened her life. You seem pretty anxious to convince my partner I'm a crook and a killer, Laura. Why? Were you working with Ruth? That's absurd. I told you, I merely picked up her overnight case for her. Well, the police will have to judge that story, Laura. Come on, we'd better go on down ahead. Uh, I wouldn't go to the police for a few hours yet, Lester. You see, I think I know who killed Ruth. But I'd rather not say till I'm certain, and I'll need your help to catch him. Well, I'll meet you later. I'll only be gone for an hour or so. They, they won't try to hold me once I explain I'm innocent. I'm afraid they will. I'm afraid they'll also place a murder charge against you. They picked Monica up just before I left the office. Monica, she's as innocent as a baby. I'm sure she is. And if you do it my way, we'll have the right man by morning. But I do need your help. And isn't there some place you could go for a few hours? Well, I have a key to Charlie Evers' place at the beach. Well, then you better get started. The quicker you're out of circulation, the better. But I want to make certain Laura goes to the police. Don't you worry about that. I'll see that she gets there. Then I'll drive out to the beach house and tell you my plans. All right. All right, Arthur. See you in an hour, sir. Oh, please, Mr. Wilson. Taking me to the police won't do anyone any good. I told you the truth about that case. I don't think so. You were going to sell those diamonds for yourself. Let me see now. Uh, 
Address the envelope to Miss Wilma Jackson. Have the messenger drop it in the mailbox of apartment 4B at 8874 Paxton Place. You... You are Mr. White. Precisely. Then Lester was telling the truth. You and Ruth were behind the diamond smuggling. Lester and Monica are innocent. You killed Ruth. For a moment or two, the frightening realization that you're alone with the murderer of your friend Ruth Cranston leaves you terrified. Then as his voice penetrates your consciousness, his purpose becomes clear. He doesn't plan to harm you. He wants to make some sort of deal with you. You watch your every action. Choose your words carefully and gradually learn the real truth about Ruth Cranston and her two-year association with Arthur Wilson in his almost perfect smuggling operation. Her callous scheme to throw suspicion on her husband Lester and his secretary when it seemed the authorities were getting close to her own activity. How she'd phoned the police last night even before she'd phoned you. Told them the same story she later told you at the Blue Oriole. How she'd planned to leave town, certain that when she failed to phone you, You'd open her overnight case, take the contents to the police, tell of your talk with Ruth, and provide irrefutable evidence that Lester and Monica were guilty of the diamond smuggling, leaving Ruth free to continue her criminal but highly profitable diamond operation. Finally, as your visitor pauses to light a cigarette. Why did Ruth have to be killed last night? Oh, Ruth was not only framing her own husband, she was planning to double-cross me with another man. Take over the operation. She had to be silenced. Why are you telling me all this? I could easily go to the police. You won't do that. You need money too badly. Otherwise, you wouldn't have phoned me this morning and offered to make a deal. I'm in a position to offer you a great deal of money. $5,000 for a half hour's work. No, thanks. I don't want to end up as Ruth did. No, you won't. This is quite safe. I simply want you to go to the police, tell them what Ruth told you regarding Lester. Turn over your evidence and advise them that he's hiding out at the Evers Beach House. You expect me to help you frame my roommate and a completely innocent man for $5,000? Why not? You can't possibly help them. The evidence against them is already ironclad. By now, I'm sure the police have found the gun that killed Mrs. Cranston. They'll also find it was Lester's gun. You mean you talk like... I mean I only want your evidence as a clincher, so to speak. Now, can you think of an easier way to pick up 5000 You watch Mr. Wilson closely. And suddenly you get an idea, don't you, Laura? You're certain that in the long run you can outwit this man. And you make your decision quickly. You decide to accept his offer, secure the money vital to your own freedom. Perhaps pick up a few additional thousands working with him during the next few weeks. Then you'll find a way to expose this man to the police and ensure the release of Lester and Monica as well as safeguard your own future. You answer in exactly the right tone of voice. You give me $5,000 just for going to the police? And a lot more as time goes on, if you care to work with me. When? Just as soon as I read in the papers that our two friends have been arrested and charged with murder. You wait about an hour, then walk down to police headquarters. Afterward, you return to your apartment and hear nothing for the rest of the day. But the following morning, when you open the paper, the story covers the front page. Killer of Ruth Cranston captured. Husband picked up in Beach House on information furnished police by late wife's friend. Killer further identified as diamond smuggler. Ballistics prove Cranston's gun found earlier near scene of crime was murder weapon. You read and reread the story with mixed feelings and wonder how soon you'll receive your fee. A fee you must have to cover your personal shortage at QB stationery and avoid prosecution for embezzlement. You wait nervously for some word from your associate. And a little before noon, your patience is rewarded. Is this Laura Haven? Yes. Uh, my name's Frank Webb. I was asked to deliver this envelope to you. Oh, well, come in for a moment while I see if it requires an answer. Looks like you had a windfall. Not the windfall I'd expected. There's only twenty-five hundred dollars here. Well, you I... better go back and tell your boss I expect the rest of the money he promised me within an hour. The rest of the money? Yes. And tell him if he doesn't send it, I'll do some talking. He'll know what you mean. Oh, come in. 
You got my message, I see. What message? Let's not be coy, Mr. Wilson. You know what message. The one I sent for the young man who brought me your $2,500. I didn't send you any money. I brought it. But he handed me an envelope containing $2,500. Who else could have... It could have been the police for all I know. What'd you say to him? I... I told him to tell you if I wasn't paid in full, I'd do some talking. You little fool. I should have known you'd mess things up. I thought you were clever. I suppose you mentioned my name, too. No, 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 I, I, I didn't. I just told him to go back to his box. Good. Then there's still time to prevent your ever mentioning it. No. No, please. Wait. Help. Help. Now, what's all the excitement about? Oh, thank heaven you got here, officer. This man was going to kill me with that letter opener. He killed Ruth Cranston, too. He's Arthur Wilson. That's the Cranston's business partner. Ruth Cranston? Yes. Oh, she's lying, Lieutenant. What reason would I have for killing my business partner's wife? To keep her from talking, exposing you as a criminal. He framed Lester and Monica Olsen, Lieutenant, and I helped him. They're both innocent. You must realize how preposterous this all is, officer. Maybe. Maybe not. We'll find out. In the meantime, you're under arrest for the attempted murder of Miss Haven. And we're holding you, too, Miss Haven, for investigation on the strength of Mr. Webb's statement. I've got a hunch that you're in this, too. At least I'm alive. You owe that to Mr. Webb here. He brought you that $2,500, and you told him you'd start talking if you weren't paid off in full. Became suspicious. Reported the incident immediately. Naturally, we got here as quickly as possible. But that money, who sent it? Better tell her, Mr. Webb. I'm the nephew of Clay Hillman, Miss Haven. When my uncle read how you had the moral courage to aid the police in capturing Lester Cranston, he felt that you deserved the $2,500 you asked him for. He said... Just like him, isn't it? Yes, it is. Instead of sending a check, he told me to get it for you in new $100 bills. He thought you'd get a thrill out of receiving it in cash. Join us again next week when, once again, the United States Air Forces in Europe presents The Whistler. This is Air Force Sergeant Don Cormay speaking.